So uh, today I'm going to be focusing on ways that we're diagnosing and improving diagnosing more accurately the type of prostate cancer and the aggressiveness of prostate cancer that a man has during active surveillance. I'm sure that many people on this call are on active surveillance right now, and so I'd be happy to, uh, to hear from you and to answer any questions that you have. So the goal is to discuss new technologies in active surveillance that aim for early detection of aggressive prostate cancer, to use state-of-the-art imaging techniques plus minus genomic sequencing, and to improve the prognostic accuracy or the prognostication to try to figure out which men are going to get upgraded during their active surveillance. So a history in the way that we've been diagnosing prostate uh, biopsies. There's certainly been an evolution in the way that we've been diagnosing prostate cancer using prostate biopsies, I should say. So about 125 years ago, uh, it was an open surgical technique. So this was similar to a radical prostatectomy, but it was a transperineal technique. It was an open surgical procedure where a chunk of prostate would be taken. The problem with this is that it caused death, it caused erectile dysfunction, and it caused incontinence. So sometimes just the diagnostic technique was, was worse than not knowing about it. Then in the 1930s, there was finger guidance, transrectal finger guidance, where you would just feel the prostate through the rectum, and then you would advance a needle to where the nodule felt firm, and then you would take that sample. About 50 years ago, this is where ultrasonography became uh, popular. And so there were ultrasound guided prostate biopsies that were done both transrectal and transperineal. And that really has been the mainstay of our diagnos diagnostic technique for the last 50 years. And then over the last 10 years, what has become uh, popular now are MRI guidance, PET guidance, and uh, now what's called mic high resolution micro ultrasound is, is entering the field. And so I'm gonna talk about some of these today to you guys. So what is the problem with the prior technique of the ultrasound guided prostate biopsy? Well, there are a couple problems. The first one is that there's actually no target to aim at. Cancer is invisible on ultrasound. So here's an example of a transrectal ultrasound of the prostate. You can see the outline of the prostate, but you certainly can't see where the prostate cancer is in the prostate gland. This means that you have to take random biopsies. It used to be that we would take six biopsies, then 10 biopsies, now 12 biopsies is the standard uh, systematic biopsy template where you take two from the apex, two from the midline, two from the base on either side. The second problem is that you're not actually sampling where you want to. So conceptualized, what you wanna do is take your two from the left apex, two from your left mid gland, two from your left base, and then the same on the other side. But when this was studied using a prostate phantom, so a low stress situation where no patient was actually involved, but just a 3D mold of a prostate was there, and experts were asked to biopsy where the green dots were. What you see is that experts actually cluster in their biopsies, and they're on, on average one centimeter away from where they wanted to biopsy. So where they actually biopsied are these red dots. And what you can tell here is that you get oversampling of certain areas like at the left base and then undersampling of other areas like no biopsies were taken from the right apex. So this is a big problem. So in order to solve problem number one, there are new imaging technologies that can see prostate cancer for the first time. So this is what a PSMA PET looks like of a prostate cancer. This is what a prostate MRI looks like of a prostate cancer. And this is what a high resolution micro ultrasound looks like of a prostate cancer. And so these are the first times that we can actually take a look at the prostate and say there's an area of suspicion prior to putting a needle into it. The second, uh, the second uh, solution is, is a way to biopsy where you want to. And so this is where state-of-the-art biopsy equipment comes into, into play. And so at the University of Alberta in 2021, we were able to secure through, philan through philanthropy uh, $737,000 worth of equipment where we were able to get an MRI ultrasound machine called a Euronav and a high-resolution micro ultrasound called an ExactView. I'm sure all of you have had prostate biopsies and you may have had biopsies using Euronav, Coelus, Artemis, several other names, or you may have had a standard ultrasound guided prostate biopsy. And so where this device here 
this MRI ultrasound biopsy device solves problem number two is that it is a way that we can fuse that MRI image with the ultrasound image. So the analogy that I have is basically what happens is uh, on day one, a man has a prostate MRI and that image is stored with a three-dimensional model of your prostate. And then when you come and see me on day 20, day 22, day 23, whenever it's time for the biopsy, so 20 days after the MRI, typically, I create a 3D model of your prostate using ultrasound. I then fuse those two images together. And then as I move the ultrasound in real time, I am in silico moving the MRI around. And I'm able to see exactly where that hot spot is in the prostate in three different dimensions. And then I'm able to take samples through that. And so this is an example of a patient who I biopsied. And what you can see is you can see that the 3D model of the prostate is shown in red, it's shown in two dimensions, coronal and axial here, the coronal on the left, axial on the right. And what you can see is you can see that there is a hot spot here shown in green. And then each one of the biopsy cores that I took are shown by these cylinders. So what you can see here, number one, is that using this device, I'm able to biopsy systematically in a pretty good fashion where I'm actually hitting those two apex, two mid gland, two base manner, and they're spread out. So I am sampling the prostate. The other thing you can see is that I'm increasing the sampling density in the area that looks suspicious for prostate cancer so that I'm not missing it. The other reason why this technology is really important is if you look at this gland, this is a small gland. So each one of these biopsy cores that are taken are 18 millimeters in length. And so when you put the biopsy needle into the prostate and then you deploy it, it goes ch -ch and it fires and it takes a sample that's 18 millimeters in length. Now, if this prostate gland were a lot bigger, you can imagine that it's a lot taller. If this hotspot were at the top of a prostate that was up here, if we sample from the bottom of the prostate, we would miss this hotspot up here. We would absolutely not sample it. So knowing exactly where we need to sample lets us uh, do a better job of sampling where the cancer is most likely to be found. And what this has led to is this has led to a paradigm shift in prostate cancer diagnoses. So first of all, when we so when I was a fellow at UCLA, we compared 16,000 biopsies that were done using systematic biopsies and compared that to 500 men who underwent an MRI guided biopsy. And what we found is we found that there was a reduction, a 50% reduction in the amount of benign biopsies and Gleason gray group one biopsies or cancers that we were finding. And importantly, we found that there was an increase in the amount of aggressive prostate cancers, the Gleason Gray group twos, threes, fours, and fives. And in fact, a doubling and a tripling of the high risk and very high risk prostate cancers. So we are finding fewer uh, cancers that need watching and we're diagnosing more cancers that need treating. So just, we've been able to now do over 800 of these biopsies over the last year uh, using this technology. The other thing that MRI fusion technology allows is it allows tracking. And so tracking is very much similar to GPS. So right now my GPS shows me in Edmonton, Alberta. And what the way the technology works for MRI ultrasound fusion is each one of those cores that you saw, each one of those cylinders, the 3D spatial coordinates of that are saved so that we are able to go back subsequently and biopsy from a similar area. And so what this allows us to do is return to the same location year after year within three millimeters of accuracy. And it actually lets us resample the same genetic clone of prostate cancer. And if you look here, this is what the prostate biopsy looks like on average of about 25,000 cores that were taken uh, during my time at UCLA over the years uh, studied at UCLA. And so what you can see here is that in the systematic biopsy, again, you are really getting using this ultrasound fusion or MRI ultrasound fusion device, you really are getting a nice distribution of two at the left lateral apex, two at the mid gland, two at the base, and the same on the other side. So you really are biopsying where you want to. Now, how is this tracking biopsy something that uh, is important for 
uh, active surveillance. Well, take this example of this patient. This is a 58-year-old man who was on active surveillance. In 2017, he had a PIRADS-3 lesion. There were two cores of Gleason grade group one or Gleason three plus three, and those are shown in red here. And then the rest of the cores are benign. So these are uh, the white cores are the benign cores. What we're able to do is we're able to basically then go back for the next biopsy and pull up exactly where this lesion was and exactly where these positive cores were, and then resample these resample these areas, go back to that area and resample these areas. And what we found when we studied this is we found that about 65% of upgrades or two thirds of upgrades are happening at tract sites at places where prostate cancer was found originally. So there is a, an age old question, and it's not completely clear, clear yet, but we have provided some evidence. The question is during active surveillance, if a man upgrades during active surveillance, is it that same cancer? Is it that Gleason grade group one cancer that was detected that ends up becoming more aggressive? Or is it a new cancer elsewhere that is becoming aggressive right from the start? And what we found is we found that at least two thirds of the time, it is that cancer that is found originally is going on to become more aggressive. Now, another thing that we found with MRI guided biopsy is we found that MRI visibility actually predicts risk of upgrading during active surveillance. So we combined uh, two data sets that we had two prospective observational trials, one at UCLA and one at NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. And these were prospective multi-center studies. And we had 519 men with Gleason grade group one prostate cancer at their confirmatory biopsy. So as you all know, the way the prostate biopsies work is it is your first biopsy where you're diagnosed with prostate cancer is called your diagnostic biopsy. About one year later, you have a second biopsy that's called your confirmatory biopsy. And that is to confirm low risk status of the disease or to find more aggressive diseases if it is there so that you can get onto treatment right away. Every biopsy you have after that is called a surveillance biopsy. So it goes diagnostic, confirmatory, surveillance biopsies. And in this, what we did is we looked at 519 men who were found to have grade group one disease at time of their confirmatory biopsy. And then we followed them for years with a median follow-up of about five years. And what this plot shows is on the x-axis, this is years from confirmatory biopsy. And on the y-axis, this is the probability of not upgrading to more aggressive disease. And we stratify this by whether you found whether prostate cancer, grade group one prostate cancer was found in a systematic biopsy only, in a targeted biopsy only, in both, or in neither. It was a negative biopsy. And what you can see here is you can see that if prostate cancer was found in a targeted biopsy, these are the green and the yellow lines, you can see that the risk of upgrading subsequently to higher risk prostate cancer was about three times higher than if a man was found to have prostate cancer only on a systematic biopsy or to not have any prostate cancer found at confirmatory biopsy. So if on your confirmatory biopsy, you were found to have no cancer, it doesn't mean that you don't have cancer. It just means that the prostate cancer is, is probably very small and you have a very very low likelihood of later upgrading to much worse disease. So this is very important to us. This means that MRI is finding features of the prostate cancer that predispose it to later upgrading. Now I will say that MRI alone is not good enough for active surveillance because in this study and in others, it is about 15 to 25% of men with negative MRIs actually harbor Gleason grade group two or higher prostate cancer. So you still need to do the biopsy. We are not there yet where uh, you can get rid of the prostate biopsy. So now is the other uh, imaging technique that I was talking about was that high resolution micro ultrasound. And so there has been progress in prostate ultrasound over the last 50 years. Here is the first prostate ultrasound image of prostate cancer. This is the prostate right here. This supposedly is prostate cancer, though I'm not entirely sure because this is not an ultrasound that I can read very well. 
This is in the middle, what conventional ultrasound looks like. You can see the outline of the prostate. You can see the peripheral zone in the outside. You can see the transition zone on the inside. You can see calcifications in white. And then imaging this exact same prostate using high resolution microultrasound on the right, you can see just how much more resolved the image is, how much um, more detail you can see. You can actually see old biopsy sites uh, using this high resolution micro ultrasound. And so it's using this device called the exact view. It's the only high resolution micro ultrasound device on the market. And what we're doing is we currently have a study going on at the University of Alberta that is expanding to the University of Montreal as well as UCLA and a site in Italy and potentially Germany as well, doing a study called music. And so this is micro ultrasound in cancer active surveillance. And so this is a prospective paired diagnostic non-inferiority trial of 210 men. The per people in this trial who are the sites in this trial, you have to have obtained an uh, expert level user of the micro ultrasound. And we're also biobanking blood, urine, and tumor tissue for later studies. And so we have a study team of radiologists, urologists, urology residents, study coordinators. And the primary outcome of this study is the difference in detection rate of grade group two or higher prostate cancer when you have a micro ultrasound guided plus systematic biopsy versus an MRI guided plus systematic biopsy. And the way this works is patients with grade group one prostate cancer by any diagnostic method. So whether it was through a, a biopsy, whether it was through a TERP, any way that they could have been found to have grade group one prostate cancer are potentially in a candidates for this study. They then get enrolled in the study and undergo an MRI. I am blinded to the MRI. The user of the high resolution micro ultrasound is blinded to the MRI. In the same biopsy session, while blinded to the MRI, you look with the high resolution micro ultrasound and any area that looks suspicious. So the MRI is given a score of one to five, like the MRI is given a score of one to five with one and two being considered negative and three to five being considered suspicious. And so anything that looks suspicious is sampled. The MRI is then unblinded and the user is able to see if there are any suspicious areas on the MRI, at which point the MRI targets are sampled and then systematic biopsies are taken. And then these are submitted for our, uh, histology, for, for pathology. And then we're looking to see if there are any uh, differences in the rates of detection of prostate cancer. And I can tell you that we have enrolled 60 patients so far, we biopsied 40 of them. And so far there are no real differences in whether a high resolution microultrasound plus systematic versus an MRI plus systematic. So this is very good because some men have contraindications to MRI. If they have a pacemaker or cochlear implant, if they're claustrophobic, they can't have an MRI. Also, MRI is very expensive and rate limit and resource limiting. Right now, if I book an MRI for a patient, it typically takes about five to six months. So it would be nice if we could do a point of care test, like a high resolution micro ultrasound, where you can avoid MRI. The other thing that we're doing is we're combining state-of-the-art imaging with genomic sequencing. And so to do this, we have a team of two urologists, myself and Eric Heinemann at the University of Calgary. We have a molecular pathologist at University of Calgary, and we have a human geneticist at UCLA. And what we're doing is we are trying to come up with a more patient-driven follow-up schematic. And so the uh, standard of care active surveillance protocols, as you all know, is you have a diagnostic biopsy at time zero, then one year later, you have your confirmatory biopsy, and then all men undergo surveillance biopsies about every two to five years. And if you continue with Gleason grade group one, then you continue active surveillance. If you get upgraded, you go on to active treatment. What we're suggesting here is we want to enhance the risk stratification. And so we would, at time of confirmatory biopsy, use image guidance and germline sequencing, that's sequencing your DNA, plus confirmatory biopsy. And what we would do is we would stratify you based on a composite risk index of the imaging of what's seen on the imaging and the germline sequencing into either low risk for upgrading or high risk for upgrading. And if you have high risk for upgrading, then we're going to follow you closely with a biopsy every one to two years. Whereas if you're low risk for upgrading, then you can stretch out that surveillance biopsy to every four or five years. 
And so we can do this because of these data like these that I've shown where we know that men who have cancer found in a targeted biopsy are more likely to be upgraded. So we have uh, gotten uh, clinical samples from about 1,300 men uh, in North America from the University of Alberta, University of Calgary, UCLA, and University of Toronto. And what we're able to do, or what we're going to do, is we're going to be running a germline sequencing panel on them. And so this is a special panel. This does not sequence the entire genome, but what it does is it sequences the about 0.1% of the human genome known to be associated with prostate cancer diagnosis, aggressiveness, lethality. And so we're going to be running these samples on using this uh, panel. Also, the, that music trial that I'm doing, we're also going to be running the samples on that and incorporate high-resolution micro-ultrasound into the uh, algorithm. And so at the end of the day, what we're going to be able to do is, hopefully, is create this, these risk calculators. And so what you can see here is you can see on the, on the x-axis, these are years after a confirmatory biopsy. On the y-axis, this is your probability of remaining free from upgrading to grade group two or higher. And if you look here, if you have no risk factors, your likelihood of remaining free from upgrading is very good. Whereas if you have an individual factor, like a family history of prostate cancer, a high PSA density, or cancer in a targeted core, these all increase your risk. And then if you have all three risk factors, that really increases your likelihood that you are going to progress. And so what we can do is we can create these models where if we use all of the risk factors, we're developing a model that the closer you get to the top left-hand corner of this, the better it is. So by incorporating all this data, we're actually take, making the model better and we'll incorporate the germline mutations uh, into this as well. So I'll stop there, and uh, I just want to thank all the funders that I have, including uh, some philanthropic uh, funders from donors, from patients like you, and you really make this research possible. So thank you. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions that you have.